Hello and welcome to Hope Lutheran Church. Welcome to a new weekend. Welcome to a new sermon study that we are going to be leading with you over the summer. And that's called our Summer Psalms. Over the 150 psalms, we're going to choose a few psalms that we're going to study every Sunday to take a look at not only the psalm, but also what God would have us learn and know and grow from with his timeless truths. This week, we're talking about prayer. How's your prayer life? Did you know that Satan loves to sit and wreck your prayer life? Well, today we're going to be looking at Psalm 86, and we're going to hear David teach us how to have better prayers. Join us. We can't wait to worship with you. Well, welcome to another Sunday. Welcome to a new sermon series that we are starting for this summer called Summer Psalms. And today we're going to be talking about and talking about God's timeless truths found in these psalms. Let's just talk a little bit about what we know about the psalms. The psalms were a unique, is a unique collection of different prayers and songs accumulated by the Holy Spirit over centuries. It's like most books. Most books were written by a man, one person, and then written by a man and it would take him, I don't know, a year or so. The Psalms were written by multiple people over a span of time. When you look at the Psalms, there's 150 of them. And some of them were written by King David. Some of them were written by Moses. And if we assume it's the Moses, that would mean that it was written uh, centuries before David was even alive. We have some written by kings, we have some written by priests, we have some written and we don't know their names. We have a collection of 150 of what we call psalms. Now these psalms over the history of the church, they were used as songs. Just like we sang a song, they would take one of these psalms, inspired by the Holy Spirit, all of them were inspired by the Holy Spirit, and they would sing them, or they would use them for prayer, or if they were going to the temple, they would say a certain psalm at a certain time that they see for the first time Jerusalem in the distance, they would stop and recite a psalm. One of the last things Jesus did with his group after he instituted the Lord's Supper, after he had a holy huddle, was he sang psalms of praise right before he got arrested. So the Psalms have always been used in the Christian church since uh, the beginning of time. And with that, though, we also see that there are some great timeless truths taught by God for us in these Psalms. And today we're going to talk about maybe the very first thing you ever learned to do when you, after you, after God made you a Christian, after God brought you to faith, Maybe the first thing you learned to do was this. Now, we just had a confirmation with Maggie here. Maggie, over two years of confirmation instruction, she learned about Jesus. She learned about God the Father. She learned about God the Holy Spirit. She learned about the Ten Commandments. She learned about uh, Christians. All these wonderful things, right? The first thing you learned, probably, when you were, you know, this tall, um, probably wasn't anything that she learned when she was in seventh grade and eighth grade in our two years of confirmation. If you think about what was the very first thing that mom and dad probably taught you how to do, it was pray, right? I mean, you can think about it. You know, uh, when you were younger or if you have kids now, uh, they're talking, they're squirming, they're squirming, and then you go and you say to them, hey, now it's time to pray. Oh, oh, oh." fold their hands, and they don't know what they're doing, but they are getting the basics down. Now it's time to talk to God. Probably the very first thing you learned how to do as a Christian was to pray. And prayer is a huge blessing for any Christian. Prayer is the time that we get to talk to God Almighty himself, the one who made the planets that we are still exploring and finding out. We get to talk to that person, the one who made all that we see, the ones that made and make sure rain is happening at the precise time. The amount of rain, for example, is happening at the precise time. The one that has given you blessings. The one that made sure that you have food waiting for you after our worship today. The one who made sure that has food waiting for you tonight. The one who has given you oxygen. 
so that you can breathe. The one that is allowing, just without you even thinking, to blink your eyes so that your eyeballs don't dry out. The one that set everything in perfect motion, we get to talk to that person. We get to talk to God through that. It is something that only Christians can do. Only us that have faith in Jesus are allowed to send our prayers through Jesus to the God of all things. And he not only promises to hear them, but he promises to answer to them. So this is one of the greatest gifts we have ever had. Besides salvation, which was given to us as a gift, besides God's free love, which is given to you because of what Jesus did for us, the gift of prayer ranks right up there as something that we absolutely should treasure as a Christian to be able to talk to God Almighty himself whenever we want. But we know that we have an adversary. We have Satan. And he will sit and he will wait and he will do everything he can to even wreck that gift that God has given to us. And he's effective at it. Let me show you. There's two things that he likes to do to wreck your prayer life. The first thing he'll do is he'll assign rules and he'll make you think that there are rules when it comes to praying. You may be thinking, well, not me. No, not me, Pastor. Maybe, you know, maybe dad down there. Maybe, you know, aunt down, cousin down there. Maybe my friend down there. Maybe they, they have, don't have it right, but not me. Let me ask you this. What are the three ways that, and I, I, you, feel free to shout out. I'm not going to embarrass you. What are the three things we usually do when it comes to prayer? What's the first thing that we do that we teach the kids? Please. Fold your hands. Yeah? You fold your hands usually when you're a kid, right? It's time to pray. Fold your hands. Whew, whew. Fold your hands. Folding your hands means that you are in submission to God. That's what it shows. It shows that you, like, are in shackles. You are in submission to God. You have power over me. Uh, you are God. I am not. That's what we're teaching. That's what we're saying with our body language when we do that. Okay? So that, that's the first thing. What's the second thing that we usually do? Close your eyes. You close your eyes. You're showing concentration. You're not seeing the cars going by. You're not seeing, you know, the, the lights flicker. You're not looking at someone over there. You are concentrating. This is my time to focus on what God is doing with me. And so I'm closing my eyes. And what's the third thing? Bow, what was it? Bow your head. Yeah, usually bow your head. So usually, what do we teach the kids? Fold your hands, close your eyes, bow your head. Bowing your head shows, uh, like if you have a pet and they bow your head, that shows that you're in submission, right? You are God. I am not. And those, we would say, are the three things you need to do to pray. Well, I'm here to tell you, nowhere is that in the Bible. In fact, if Jesus were here, and if he were to pray, he would not probably be doing those three things. Those are absolutely man-made things that we have made up. And if you say that that's the only way to pray, you've already made and put laws onto God's gift of prayer that he has never asked us to. Do you know how Jesus prayed? Well, first off, when he was uh, about to go to the cross, he prayed face down, nose to the ground, prostrate, prostrate, prostrate to the ground, showing absolute submission. That's what kings would make their subjects do or conquered kings do to show that I've conquered you. You would lay down, face into the ground, and that's how Jesus prayed. But usually in prayer life, they would pray absolutely like this. They would pray with their eyes up. What does that signify? All good gifts come from my Lord. They don't come from my hand. They don't come from you. They come from my Lord. My hands, my hands would be out, signifying a cup or a vessel that will accept any good gift that comes from God. And my eyes, they wouldn't be closed. They would be open because my eyes are focused on my Lord. So that, if, if Jesus were here, don't be surprised if that's how he would pray because that's how the Bible tells us. Pray with open arms. Pray with open hands to the Lord. And so with that, if that seems weird to you, if that seems like, you know what, um, but that's not how you pray, you already see the devil at work. You already see him working to wreck the joy and the gift that prayer has in your life. Here's a second thing that uh, Satan will uh, wreck your prayers. How many of you would have the guts to come up here and lead us in the Lord's Prayer after, later on? Ooh, ooh. Now, we're, now we're getting... Some of us would, sure. Some of us would. Um, but when it comes to leading prayer, oh, that's usually the pastor's job, right? If we're ever in a small group, 
or if we're ever in uh, you know, a Bible study and I go around and I say, okay, does anybody want to pray? How many of you usually shoot up your hand? Yeah, I'd love to pray. I'll, I'll make it up as I go. I'll just talk about what's going on. Ugh. What do we usually hear? Usually hear, oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I would say. Uh, I'm not really sure what to say. Uh, Pastor, you know, you know how to pray better than I do. You, you go ahead and say those things, right? If you f- ever feel like you don't know what to say, or if it's someone else's job to pray for you, or to pray on your behalf, or you know what, I am not good at praying, and so I shouldn't be praying, Satan has already got a foothold. Satan has got a foothold in your prayer experience. And so today, that's where I want King David to help us because he's going to show us a prayer life. Of all people, King David showing us a healthy prayer life in Psalm 86. And those are the timeless truths I want to look at today, where Jesus or God basically says in Psalm 86, let's just talk. Let's just talk. Let's have a conversation. Tell me what's on your mind. I want to hear what's on your mind because I have a relationship with you and I promise to act. So let's study this psalm together and let's glean out the timeless truths in it. We're going to go to Psalm again, Psalm 86. And it begins simply by saying this, that it's a prayer of David. Now, that's interesting and that's noteworthy because King David was King David. He is the king of all kings in human eyes of of Israel. And the Holy Spirit took one of his prayers here and he recorded it. Now, there could be a couple ways that this happened. Maybe he was inspired to write it down by the Holy Spirit. That could have happened, and they put it and called it Psalm 86. Or maybe the Holy Spirit liked his prayer and said, you know what, I loved your prayer. We're going to write that one down, and it's going to be useful for time and eternity for other people. But however it happened, David prayed this prayer, either out loud or he wrote it down, and the Holy Spirit said, and inspired that, and then put this in our laps and said, I want you to learn about your Lord through this prayer. So with that, King David is going to help us out here today. Uh, And with that, just listen to how King David speaks to his Lord. It's not, you're going to find it's not formal. It's not fancy words. You're going to hear a king, yes, but a Christian just talking to his father. A child of God talking to his father about the things going on in his life. So let me read this and we'll, we'll glean out Uh, timeless truths for us. He starts out by this way. He says, Hear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant. For you, O Lord, uh, I lift up my soul. Again, getting back to the fact that he starts us out by saying that King David wrote this. It is interesting that even though King David wrote this, he had all the ri- he's the richest man in the world. He is the richest man in Israel. He has the most powerful. He is the king of the only superpower at that time, Israel. And yet his attitude is, Lord, I've got nothing. Without you, I am nothing. Without you, I have nothing and I need everything from you. I am poor. I am needy. I need all these blessings coming from you. And with that, even though I'm king, and even though people look to me, and even though people trust me and expect me to lead, Lord, I'm only looking at you. You alone have my hope. You alone have my trust. You alone have my attention. And all this, he says, is through the gift of faith. He says, Lord, you are a forgiving and good You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. Even though he is king, he trusts in the king of kings. Even though he is the one that has all the power, he realizes it all comes from God. And I'm going to go to you and trust in you and what you have done for me. I'm trusting in your kindness. I'm trusting in your mercy. I'm trusting in your patience. I'm trusting in your blessings. Going on, he says, Lord, among you, among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. 
Isn't that a great reminder for us today? Just think back. If you were to make a trophy of the one thing you're most proud of in your life, do you know what it would be? Can you think of it? I mean, it's not a trick question. Is there something that you are so proud of? If you were to make a trophy, if you were to put something on your tombstone, if you were to put something and title your book, what's the thing that you're most proud of? Let me ask you a second question. What are you good at? If I were to ask you, what, what are you good at? Maybe your gift is, I'm, able, I'm a great baker. Maybe it is, I'm great at finances. Maybe it's, I'm great at being a friend. I'm a good listener. How has God created you, and what has God made you and made you good at in your life? What have you done that you're proud of, and what are you, what are you able to do that you're proud of? And what David would say is, yeah, that's great. Let's not forget where that came from. That all came from God. God is the one that blessed you with the things that you are proud of. God is the one that blessed you with your abilities and your talents. God is the one that did all these things. And again, it's amazing that King David is saying that. Because as kings, we know it can be pretty, you know, you can feel pretty good about yourself when you have power. Now, you might not be thinking, you may be thinking to yourself, well, pastor, I'm not a king, so I don't know if I... We, we fall into that trap, though. We like to be kings of our world. We like to be little gods of our own little universes. We like to have things done just our way. So with that, it's a good reminder that King David, who had everything, had all the power, no one could tell him no, said, you know what, everything I have, Lord, that power, everything, comes from you. It's a good reminder for us. The things that you have are from God. They're not from your own hands. Because God made those hands, and God gave you the talent, and God gave you those abilities, and God gave you the wherewithal to do those things. So not only, so King David tells us, all these things are from God. God has done all these great things for me in the past, but he doesn't stop. He actually continues. David says this, he says, with this relationship between God and I, does, it continues. He says, teach me your way, O Lord. Teach me your, your way, and I will walk in your truths. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. So not only have you given me these things, Lord, but continue to teach me. Continue to lead me. Continue to grow me and mold me and shape me. And that's what God does for us today. There are times when God molds you and shapes you and grows you by saying yes to the things you want. Yep, I will give you that promotion. Yep, I will give you another child. Yep, I will give you that ability. Yep, you're going to have a clean bill of health next time you go in. Because he hopes that every time you look and say, this all came from the hand of God. The fact that I beat cancer. The fact that I am able to make budget. The fact that I'm able to go to work in a job. All those are from God's hand. And there's times when God says, I'm going to mold you by saying no. I know you well enough to know that if, you, if this were to be given to you, it might take you away from your faith. I'm not going to allow this to happen to you. I care more about spending eternity with you than your quick happiness, so I'm going to say no. Now is not the time for the promotion. Now is not the time for a clean bill of health. Now is not the time for you to make budget because I want you to grow in your faith, trusting and looking to me. And then finally, the third way that God will answer our prayers is by saying, I'm going to grow you by just having you wait for a while. We're going to work on patience. We're going to see if you're going to continue to talk to me or if you're going to get so mad that I seem to have said no that you're just going to walk away. Are you going to grow with me? Are you going to work on patience? Are you going to continue to trust in me when it seems like I'm quiet? Where are you with your spiritual life? I'm going to grow you in your patience by just saying, you know what, I'm going to give you that promotion. But I'm going to get left you wait. Budget's going to be tough this year, but next year will be different. You know, this time is going to be a, a not a clean bill of health. Next time, though, it'll be different. And God will grow us through, by letting us say, uh, by having us wait. That's what David is asking for. Teach me. Continue to grow me. Continue to strengthen me so I can walk in your truth. And with that, like David usually does in his Psalms, he then turns his attention to the problem of the day. Now, as king, he is the most powerful, all these things, but it was never an easy route. It was never an easy leadership. 
He always had issues, and he took those issues, and he took those problems to our Lord. And we can say the same today. If we were to make a list, there's so many things that God has blessed us with. There's so many things that God's hand is in that we can probably see. Without God, I wouldn't have been able to do this. Without God, I wouldn't have been able to do this. But that doesn't stop the fact that this week, I'm not looking forward to X. And when I see that person, I know they're going to bring up Y, and I really don't want to talk about it. And I really don't want to look at my finances this week or my retirement this week because it is looking like Z. So, Lord, here is my problem. Here is what's going on in my life. And that's what David does and encourages us to do. In this case, the arrogant are attacking me, O God. A band of ruthless men are seeking my life, men without regard to you. But you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Grant your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Give me a sign of your goodness that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, O Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Isn't that a great psalm? I just love this psalm. It just, it's just very real life for me. It shows that not only is David a king, but he is also a human. He's also a man. He's also asked to live in this sinful world, and with it, he uses this opportunity to talk to his father, his heavenly father, speak to him about the things going on. Okay, let's transition. To, uh, let's bring this around to us. Let's put this into our lap what does this psalm mean for us today? What does this mean for us as we go into our mission fields? What does this mean for us as we go back to work this week? Um, there, are, there are a few things that I think God wants us to know in this text. The first thing is this, is like we said at the beginning, if you notice how many things David asked for, how many things David brought up. I put it down. I put down every request in this psalm that David asked. And there are 15 of them. 15 things that, that he has asked for. And let me ask you, some of those are easily attainable. Some of those seem like things that only God can do. Let me ask you, when you pray, how big are your prayers? How big is your God? You know how I can tell how big your God is? By the size of your prayers. Are you just asking for, you know, thanks? Are you asking for the bold? Are you asking that only the God of the universe can answer? Because he can answer, and he does. David here is just talking to his father and talking to him about anything and everything, some small, some big. But he knows the relationship he has with his father, and with it, he talks to him about big things and small things. So when we go and we go to our Lord in prayer, the first thing he wants us to do, and what we learn here, just talk to him. Call upon him. Speak to him. Just talk to him about the things on your hearts and mind. What do you want? If you were, you know, how, do, how often do we say, if you're God for a day, what would you do? You have God listening to you. What would you have him do? Talk to him about those things. Ask for the miraculous. Ask for the everyday, because it shows your relationship with him. The second thing is remember, prayer is a great spiritual barometer. It shows you where you are in your relationship to God. Are you trusting in yourself? Well, then you're probably not praying so much, are you? Are you trusting in God? Well, then you're probably talking to him a lot because there's a lot going on in your life. If you're ever wondering, where is my spiritual life? How big is my faith? How healthy is my faith? Take a look at how often you talk to your Heavenly Father, who again has promised to hear every prayer and answer every prayer. How often are you talking to him? Because if you're not talking to him too much, it's probably because you're trusting in yourself instead of trusting in the one that has done everything for us. And then finally, Remember that God promises to act, and sometimes he will even act because we ask him. Sometimes he promises to even change his mind because we ask him. And so take advantage of that. We have the ability today, this afternoon, this week, to go back to the very first thing we ever learned, and that was to pray. Take advantage of that, because you have a Lord that was willing to send his son to rescue you so that he could spend eternity with you. You have God the Father, God the Son, sending his Holy Spirit to counsel you, to teach you, to grow you, to carry every prayer that you have given up to the Lord and give it to him so that he will answer. This is the relationship you have with him. You are a child of God, washed clean of your past, 
washed clean of your sins, and now the Lord says, you know what? You're my child. Let's talk. Let's do that right now. Let's end our sermon study here by going to our Lord and speaking to him in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love to hear that you are compassionate and slow to anger and patient and wanting to hear from us through prayer. We know that uh, we anger you every day, but you deal with your believers tenderly and through grace. Just as the sparrow, every sparrow has your attention, we know that our prayers to you gets even more of your attention. Today and this week, let us be reminded that we can speak to you at any time, in any place, about anything. And let all of our prayers be carried by God the Holy Spirit through faith in God the Son to you, God the Father, for your action. Amen. After hearing what our Lord has done for us, there are many ways we can respond. And today, just me and you, I would like to talk to you about maybe the most impactful way that you can respond to what God has done for you. And that is giving back to God. We can give back to God through our time. We can give back to God through our talents. But we can also give to God in maybe the most impactful way, and that is through our treasure. In June, I want to spotlight one place that your offerings go to help support, and that is the orphanage in India that we have helped support for many years. When we give to this orphanage in India, we are giving to a place that takes the blessings that we have given to them in money form and they use it in a real way for textbooks, for pencils, for lunches, so that kids can eat. If you want a way that you can give back to God through hope and help impact people all around the world, this is a wonderful way for you to do that because the money that we give goes right to them. There are other ways that you can give, and that is when you give to God through hope, you're giving to other ministries, local ministries, but the place we're spotlighting is the orphanage in India. Can I suggest that today you make a prayerful gift to God through hope to help support missions like this? If you've never given to hope, the information is below. If you have given to hope, I want to thank you for your generosity and the fact that we, through your gifts, are able to touch people locally and internationally with the same gospel message, that same message of love and forgiveness that you just heard about from Jesus. For those of you that have given, thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your generosity. It was an honor to worship with you today. Thanks again for worshiping with us. It's great to have you with us. If there's anything I can do, please let me know. Otherwise, Lord's blessings now as you go into your mission field. As always, because of Jesus, you have hope.